Hello, my name is Mauricio Anishi. I'm an assistant professor in software engineering at the Delft University of Technology. And on behalf of my colleagues, Frank and Feline, I'm going to present our paper, Grading 600 Plus Students, a case study on peer and self-grading. Let me start by giving you some context. TU Delft has been facing a large influx of computer science students. In the year of the case study, we received 900 first years. And by the end of the first year, which is when they take my software testing course, they were around 600 students. The lectures were even happening in the TU Delft Auditorium, which you can see in the slides. An important part of the course was the lab work, or is the lab work, J. Pacman. J. Pacman is a Pacman game written in Java, and students have to apply different testing techniques to ensure that the game works properly. The assignment is composed of four parts. Every part is delivered by the students and then graded by our teaching assistants. The assignment was always done in pairs, also to reduce our workload. However, now with 600 plus students or 300 pairs of students, we needed a very large army of teaching assistants to help us in grading everything. And that's just too much work, too much time consuming. So we decided to explore some alternatives and we came up with the conclusion, let's just try some self and peer grading. How did this work in practice? As I said, students work in pairs and they work on the different assignments we ask them to do. Once they are done, they deliver formally the assignment, which is then when the peer and self grading process starts. So students would grade themselves and then they would grade a random team that is assigned to them automatically by our tool. All the grading is supported by the very specific rubrics we devised. Those rubrics were basically multiple choice questions and students would just have to pick the one that fit the most. And this is how we calculated the final grades. Also as a sanity check mechanism, we looked at the ones where the difference between the self grade and the peer grade was interesting, significant, and we then involved the teaching assistants and they also grade those deliverables. Of course, for this case study to be perfect, we would have paid teaching assistants to grade all the deliverables, but that was simply not possible due to many constraints. So we had to decide which assignments to grade. And as I said, the interesting ones, and we decided to involve TAs whenever there, is a, uh, there was a high difference between self and peer grade. And by high difference, we meant 25% difference. We also decided to investigate all the grades where both self and peer grades were very high. So higher than 90% in both. And then also we did some random checks by selecting random teams. At the end, we received 906 submissions that were self and peer graded and 248 of those were actually double checked by our teaching assistants. We asked three research questions. How do peer and self grades compare to each other? Second question, how do TA grades compare to the self and peer grades? And third research question, do social demographic characteristics influence self and peer grades? For the first research question, what we observe is that on average, self grades tend to be 8 to 10% higher than the peer grades, which is quite expected. That was our hypothesis at the beginning that students would give themselves a higher grade than the peers. Interesting to notice that around 25% of the teams uh, gave themselves a self grade lower than their peers. That is uh, very interesting in a point of attention in practice. And of course, precise matches between the self grade and the peer grade rarely happen. If we now compare to the grades that TAs would give to these assignments, what we notice is that the peer grades, they seem to be a good approximator of the TA grades. So in this picture, I show the 
third stratum, as we call in the paper, so the teams that were randomly selected by checks. This means they did not fit in any of the categories, so the difference was smaller than 25% between the self grades and the peer grades, and the grades were not higher than 90%. You see that the second box plot, which is the, the difference between the peer grades and the TA's grade, they are near zero, which shows that the peers gave a very similar grade to the TA's. In the paper, we show the box plots for the other comparisons, for the other stratum, so um, grades that are very high or grades that the self and peer were very different. And a second observation that we make is that when, uh, in, in cases that the self grade and the peer grade diverge significantly, the TA grade lied in between. So students gave themselves a very high grade, peers gave this thing a lower grade, and the TA grade was in between. Finally, when we tried to control for gender and nationality, we did not see any significant difference in the way different groups self-grade and grade others. So in this picture, I basically show teams that are composed only by men and they do self-grading and peer grading then groups that are composed only by women and groups that are composed by men and women and if you compare the two sets of box plots there are no statistical significant differences of course in practice there might be differences at an individual level and as a teacher you should make sure that no one is harmed because of their own way of grading himself or herself that is something i'll discuss in a minute so after this uh, analysis what did we conclude well we concluded that self and peer grades seem to be a viable alternative at least for grading lab assignments like the ones we have right now. I did not mention this uh, so far, but this assignment was responsible for 20% of the final grade. So also the importance of the assignment towards the big picture of the grade was not so big. So for this type of assignments, we believe self and peer grades are a good alternative and it's just cheaper and easier to do than involving a very large army of TAs. In practice, we decided to pick the highest grade between the self and the peer, or the TA grade when the TAs graded it. Given that we noticed that the difference was not so big in the random groups, the highest grade seemed to be the most fair one to avoid any sort of discussions. Of course, this might mean we are giving high grades to students that do not deserve it. But again, this was just 20% of the overall grades and the impact was not so large. Recommendations. So pay attention to the extra workload that this gives to students. So our students reported around one hour to self grade and one hour to peer grade times four. So this is eight hours that they have to, to work more and you have to balance this in the design of your course. Coming up with very good rubrics is an important point. Our rubrics evolved over time, over many years, and this is one of the factors that we believe made this experiment so successful. That was it, that was our um, case study. Let us know if you have any questions. Bye bye. Welcome to the QA part of our first uh, paper in this session. Uh, here we have Mauricio Anici to answer and discuss the results of this uh, paper with uh, all of us. So please introduce your questions in the chat. They will be very welcome. Uh, we already have a question uh, by Mariam. Uh, he said, I might have missed it, but uh, can you say something to the acceptance of the students? Do students accept per grading of their work? Very good question, Mariam. So we put this as a 
um, rule of the course, so things would be peer graded and the divergences would be checked by TAs. So there was not a lot of space for them not to accept it. We did not receive complaints after the course was done. So maybe in a way it worked out, but yeah, if they accepted that, I cannot really answer that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then Kai uh, uh, does another, uh, oh no, sorry, Max was before. Uh, okay, Max says, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, based on your results, based on the graded rubric, can you list factors that contribute to the observed difference in grading? Yes, great question, Max. So those differences were mostly in questions that were subjective by nature. So for example, we have assignments on test code quality and then assessing how good the test code of the student is, is a bit subjective. And then different students had different opinions. Um, yeah, so yeah. I, had, I had a comment related to this question is, for example, in, in this case where there are very different uh, opinions between the self-assessment and the peers assessment how do you deal if, if you consider the possibility to define a meeting with the students to discuss maybe these subjective uh, issues very good question so we so first it, we try to make the rubrics as objective as possible so for example mm -hmm. those are the test cases you should see in this exercise so on and so forth for, for the ones that were not so objective we tried as much as possible to make it objective and we saw a difference and we never really considered the idea of putting the two groups together to discuss. I love this idea, by the way, Anna, maybe that's something for me to do in the future and let them resolve the issue together. Mm -hmm. What we did was we asked the TAs to do um. the checks, right? And from what we observed in our paper, the TAs seem to be in this sweet spot between the evaluation of the students and the evaluation of the, the peer. Hmm. Okay, good. Uh, but if, okay. I, if I can compliment, uh, because sure. Also, the reviewers asked me about this. So I think the rubrics were a huge uh, factor of influencing this study. I think it was positive. We, we observed nice results because we spent a lot of energy in making such a very nice and objective rubric. So I think if you're planning to apply this, you really have to put a lot of effort in coming up with rubrics. Did, did you provide this rubric to the students in advance before doing their assignments or, or not? After, afterwards. After. So, Yes. Uh, what, what do you think? Do you think that it might be interesting to give them the rubrics before so they know how are they going to be evaluated? Good question. I'm always in doubt whether I should show the rubrics before or after. Yeah. And, and of course, if you show before, they will better know what to do, but maybe they will also gain the rubric. Yeah. So yeah. They will also focus on, on passing the rubric and not exactly. developing other, other ideas or exactly. yeah, other skills. Mm. Okay, Kai, uh, make another comment. You mentioned that self and peer grading appear to work well for lab assignments. Do you have an insight on how well this might work for large or more complicated assignments? That's a good question, Kai. I discussed this in the paper that um, I'm not really sure if you can use peer and self grading for, for everything, right? So in here, my lab work was 20% of the, the course, so not a lot. And I felt safe in not really being so thorough in, in giving this 20%. I'm not really sure how students would behave if they were grading the final exam, which is like 80% of the course. Yeah. There, we need to do more responsibly, I think. And I think mm -hmm. it's still to be evaluated how this would work. I'm not even sure if, you know, how the students would think about this. Future work, if you do that, let me know. <laughs> okay. Uh, this uh, another question about the um, the information provided by the by the peers is just uh, the grade uh, qualification mark, or they provide uh, some kind of qualitative feedback uh, to to their peers. Great question. Our tool allowed students to um, write open things, right? So mm -hmm. there was an open box you could write every anything you wanted, and students wrote stuff, but those things were very short. Okay. So most of the feedback that you would receive was like the checklists and then the answer of the the peer. Yeah. So in this case, maybe that um, a meeting or a joint discussion would uh, allow a bigger discussion and more detailed discussion and interaction between between them. 
Definitely. Yeah. We, we consider the ideal of having an open question for every exercise, but our lab work is pretty extensive and yeah. that would just double the time that students would take to do this. And this is one of the complaints from, uh, from the students. Uh, I'm not sure if they complained explicitly, but this was some sort of analysis I did. Like they had to spend maybe 10 hours extra, you know, in my course because of all this peer and self grading. So it's 10 hours that they had to find, I have to put it in the schedule, right? So it's a lot of effort for students to actually do peer grading and self grading. So you yeah. have to really do, uh, calculate this trade off, right? How much time you want them to spend on this. But it's 10, 10 hours for self-assessment and peer assessment or 10 hours for peer assessment? For, for So our estimate was that uh, students were taking one hour to do the assessment. So the self-assessment one hour, ah. the peer assessment another hour, and then times three or four of those uh, lab deliverables that we had. So eight hours ah, more okay. or less in, okay. in the entire course. Okay, okay. Okay, good. Um, so, any more questions or uh, comments? We still have three minutes. There's a question by Ita there. Oh, where? I don't see it. Oh, so yes, sorry. Uh, Ita, yeah, thank you for such interesting talk and I'm delighted to see that you did look at gender. I'm wondering through whether with regard to gender, you look at those whose self-grade was lower than per grade or if you have any insights on this? Very good question. And this was what triggered some discussion on Twitter when I tweeted about this paper. So, uh -huh. of course, in our paper, we, we look at gender and um, nationality backgrounds in, in, in an aggregated fashion, right? So in the long run, we did not see like gender being a statistical factor there. But of course, at an individual level, you see students that are just more shy and they have more trouble in grading themselves than other students. Um, so th that is something to pay attention to whenever you're doing this peer grading that you might be harming someone that is just very bad at assessing himself or herself. What we did uh, uh, was to, whenever there was uh, two grades and they were very close to each other, we went for the highest grade. So we would never punish the student that for some reason mm. uh, gives himself or herself a lower grade. Uh, when we, we had a TA grading, then we trusted on the TA's grade. This is, by the way, why I think you should really think how to do this in an exam, right? Because maybe you don't want to go for the highest grade in the exam and yeah. you maybe give higher grade to someone that doesn't deserve it. But that's definitely something to pay attention if, if you implement self and peer grading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Good question. Okay, one more minute. Any other issue? Maybe then one remark from me that, that I, I found really curious because I'm not someone from the educational field, right? And then when I was reading about self and peer grading, I saw that most of the papers suggest people to start grading the peer and then yourself. But that sounded uh -huh. counterintuitive to me because to me it makes more sense to grade myself first, I understand my answers, and then I can compare to the rubric and then I will do a better job at assessing my peer. But that was just my reasoning after reading just a bunch of papers in the educational field. They probably have a reason to do this in the other way around. So maybe that's something to also read if you're, if you're planning to do self and peer grading. Hmm. Yeah, this is an interesting thing. I mean, probably there should be some em empirical data <laughs> about yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it is not easy to find it. Okay, we have another comment from Ita. She said, maybe your rubric was so good that it eliminated bias, which would be great. <laughs> we tried as much as possible to be very objective, right? And in a lot of exercises related to software testing, you can be, right? Like you have to mock class A. You should not mock class B. So this was mo most like checking stuff. And so I think that that helped a lot, but still open questions. Yeah, I don't remember. Do